Welcome to the Blue Mountains International Hotel Management School Leadership Series. And a special welcome to students at the Suzhou campus in China, the Inti campus in Malaysia, Stanford campus in Thailand, and of course, our students at the Lura campus in the Blue Mountains. If you have any questions today for our speaker, please email them to leadershipseries at bluemountains.edu.au. I'm extremely pleased to welcome Mr. Lolik Pung, founder, CEO, and hotelier of the very successful hotel chain Unlisted Collection. Mr. Lo, thank you very much for your valuable time today. And I'd like to start our discussion by asking you, where did it all start? Especially moving from a successful career in law to founding Unlisted Collection. Well, I, I, I did, as you say, uh, start, start out as a lawyer. But you know, when I went, was in practice in uh, uh, law, I actually was doing my bar exams in, in the UK and I moved back to Singapore because this was in the late 90s, like 95, 96 at the time, and I was thinking about where to go in my career. And at that time, you know, I came from a fairly traditional Asian family. They all like, well, you've got to do a profession, you know. At that time, there was nobody ever talked about entrepreneurship or doing anything like that. And I, I come from a family of doctors. Both my parents are doctors, you know. Um, and, and so I, I almost became a doctor, but I pursued law instead. And when it came time to, to kind of think of a career, I was... I was thinking of moving back to Singapore, um, and I did. Um, but you know, my timing wasn't so good because I moved back in. Uh, I think it was '97, '98. That was, you know, you all, all of you are obviously way too young to to remember this. But at that time, it was the, the the Asian crisis when a lot of economies in Southeast Asia, in particular, were going bust. I mean, you were having you know mass layoffs in places like Thailand and Philippines and Indonesia. Singapore was also badly hit. So when I went back to practice as a barrister, you know, um, you know, at that time, Ali McBeal was a very popular TV show. Um, and, and I had all these dreams about, you know, fighting for justice. But in reality, all I was doing was, was working for banks, bankrupting people. You know, at that time, that was the only work going. It was, it was, it was a, you know, a young lawyer. You would spend all your day in court doing bankruptcy petitions, doing writ of seizure and sale. Really miserable work. You, you kind of got a front row seat to, to, to the disintegration of people's lives and businesses. And, and, and two years into that, I was like, man, this is <laughs> way more than I bargained for. And, um, you know, but at the same time, it was, it was, it was an eye opener for me because I, I really got to, to look at how businesses run, you know, the type of, of people who were, who were out there doing these business, these, some of the big business deals, you know, we had a lot of Indonesian clients and you could see them having these multi-billion dollar businesses that just collapsed overnight, you know. So for me, as a young uh, a lawyer, getting a front row seat on that it was really an invaluable lesson. And at, at the same time, you know, when I was working for banks, we were doing a lot of mortgagee sales. And, and so, you know, being the most junior lawyer in the, in the firm, I'd be doing all the processing of all the documentations. And so you see all these properties coming on the market, you know, and, and literally, you know, when they go for auction, you'd see some of these going for maybe a quarter of, or, or, or less of, of the price that they had been developed for. So, you know, sitting on my desk every day, I was looking at all these documents. And at the time, as a lawyer in, in Singapore, you'd, you'd be expected to work till midnight, more or less, you know, um, and, and on weekends. And I'd have all these huge sheets of paper and signing them off. And I'd be like, wow, all these properties, they're going so cheap. And, and one particular property kept kind of coming across my desk. Uh, it was this um, um, old shop house, well, a whole a, a row of old shop houses in a, in Chinatown, a place called Kyongsiak Road, a red light area. Uh, for those of you who've ever been to Singapore, at that time a very notorious red light area, but beautiful old buildings. And I said, "Wow, this this is a beautiful building." Odd, you know, admittedly not the best location, um, but that became my first hotel because eventually I, it came across my desk four times, I think. Went for auction four times and nobody would, well, nobody would touch it. And, and I, I borrowed a bit of money and, and purchased it and became my first hotel in 1929. And at the time, you know, Singapore didn't really have any boutique hotels. Nobody would have dreamt of putting a hotel in, in Chinatown and, 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 you know, least of all in the, in the red light area of Chinatown. But it was a wild success and, and you know, we opened in 2013. And, and, you know, all the papers wrote about the fact that this uh, young, stupid lawyer, probably they wrote, 
had opened this uh, interesting boutique hotel in Chinatown, and, and, and that was our very first property. So, so why that location? I mean, you said it was a, a fairly notorious red light district, and obviously when we think about Singapore, very much a convention city, large five-star hotels and so on, so you're certainly going against the trend, opening a small boutique hotel in a, in a fairly notorious area. Why? Yeah, it was a tiny boutique hotel, 32 rooms and a, and a little restaurant. And, and the answer to that was it was the only area I could afford. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, we, we, I got it for a song. If you look back now, you know, it, you'd just be amazed, you know. Um, yeah, it, it literally went for a song because at the time, in the depth of the Asian crisis, nobody would touch these properties. So at the time, you know, the view also was that these conservation properties were expensive to maintain and poor value because you couldn't intensify the use beyond, beyond what it was there because the, the government had then stepped in to preserve these buildings. You know, in the 80s in Singapore, whole swathes of Chinatown were being knocked down in order to build high towers. And at some point, the government said, hey, hang on, you know, all our heritage is disappearing. So they, they put preservation orders on these buildings. And, and the first early investors in these shop houses um, were, were people who kind of realized that at some point, these will have value because the, the, guy, the developers got out of the game because they couldn't tear them down. So I got it very cheap, to be honest. You're a lot more strategic now in relation to where you open your properties in a destination. What's the formula? You know what, in, in a way, we, I, I still have that early lesson of doing 1929 in my head because what I gleaned from that experience was that, you know, um, these unfashionable or then unfashionable areas would be cheaper, you know, um, and it was vo always very important to have a, a building with a lot of character. And, you know, it, it still had to have a very strong local flavor. And, and, and to this day, I always look at those three things. I mean, I, I do boutique hotels. We, we tend to have smaller properties, you know, 100 rooms and under. We tend to have a lot of F&B. We tend not to be in the very most fashionable, most expensive parts of town because we can't afford it, you know. So if you look at in, in, in uh, Sydney, we, we bought into Chippendale, what, five years ago? Um, at that time, it was still a brewery. Uh, that building, you know, that you stand there now and, and you look at... Uh, Central Park, none of that was there when we first went there. It was still part of the Carlton United Brewery. And, and there was the old Clare pub and then the administration building. Um, you know, if you go there now, it looks amazing, that district. But when I bought that four or five years ago, <laughs> I, you know, I, had, I, I really had to put a lot of faith in the developers that they would build what they told me they would build. Because um, when I first saw it, I was like, okay, you know, nobody's going to come here. Um, but it's turned out to be very successful, and, and I think it's the same when all the countries we've gone to. In London, we, we you know, restored the old town hall of Bethnal Green. Those of you who are familiar with London will know that Bethnal Green is not the most salubrious neighborhood. Um, uh, it's a lot more fashionable now, but we opened maybe, we bought that building maybe about four years before the Olympics was announced, so you know, at the time it was cheap again. And the east end of London, of course, has blossomed now because of all the development that, that's related to to partly the Olympics and partly just gentrification. And, and so we, we, we kind of learned some early lessons from that, you know, to try and find less fashionable neighborhoods that we thought would, would have long-term potential, very strong local flavors in them, always reasonably close to the center of town still, or, or have very good transport links, and, and have a good local community, because I think that's important for a hotel, you know. I think you, you also argue that's also very much important for the guest experience as to why those particular hotels are located where they are. Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, our typical guests, the, the, the ones I speak to, always appreciate the fact that, you know, our hotels are located in, in, in local neighbourhoods that people like, uh, you know, well, in Chippendale, the Australians hang out there, you know. It's not a typical tourist neighbourhood. You, you're not going to go in there and, and meet a... a, a you know, a, a, a whole bunch of Germans or people from China just there on a tourist package. It's not, you know, and the same with East End of London or, or South Bund in, in Shanghai or, or Little India and Singapore. They tend to be populated by locals, you know, people who have a, a, a stake in the neighborhood. And so for us, giving our guests that experience of what the city is truly like is, is invaluable. So they, they get to go eat in the restaurants that locals visit. Uh, and patronize, they go to the local coffee shops, they, they hopefully patronize the, the local shopping, the art galleries, things like that. We don't want them to go to, you know, go, go, uh, a big shopping center with a Gucci and a, and a Starbucks, you know. You, you can get that in any city, right? And, and look, if you're, if you're after that whole five-star, four-seasons experience, high, 
they're, they're going to do it a lot better than someone like me. I want to give them a local flavor of what a city is like and what a local community in that particular city does. So for me, that, that neighborhood's key, very, very important. If I could take you back to, to 1929, in the first couple of years, as a new company, a hospitality company, what were some of the key challenges and, and how did you overcome them? Actually, you know what, I, 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 again, I'm not sure, you know, you guys are all too young to remember SARS, but SARS happened in 2003, and that's when we opened uh, 1929, and that was probably the most traumatic event <laughs> in my, in my uh, career. In, in a, in, I mean, in retrospect, it, it wasn't that bad, but at the time, it was, a, it was a hammer blow to the industry. You know, Singapore, I think the hotel industry went down to single digits, literally, in, in, the, in a matter of days. You know, and, um, uh, and and it was a very tough time. Um, so that was probably my, my very first lesson in, in you know, uh, adverse business conditions. Obviously, as a, as a professional, I had seen it during the Asian crisis, but to experience it in a very personal way in my own business was, was literally when, when SARS happened. But, but it taught me a lot of lessons, and, I, and, and I'm very glad in some ways that, um, that that lesson came early on because you know, our first six months, we were coasting. We had great reviews. Suddenly, the hotel was full overnight. And I was a bit surprised, to be honest. I was like, wow, maybe this is all me, you know? But, but, um, but no, you know, I mean, SARS brought us right down to, to, to Earth just like that. And, and kind of really, if I look back at the lessons that I learned, you know, it's really about bringing the team together and, and having a, a very close um, knit team so that you can overcome these big challenges. Because, you know, running a hotel or any kind of business really is more than just yourself. It takes a, a whole team of people. And you really got to, um, you know, I remember at the time, everyone sterilizing handrails and lift buttons and having all these sort of things. You know, we all had to pitch in um, because it was just that, that challenging. And, and the fact that, you know, we had to really halve our business costs overnight because we went from running in the 90s to having, you know, maybe 20% occupancy. Um, Fortunately, it didn't last that long because it, had it been a very extended um, downturn, I don't think any business could have survived. But I think it went on for about two, three months, you know, and, and we had a small team at that time. Um, everyone took a, a proportionate pay cut, you know, and as the leader, you take the first and the biggest. Um, and it, we, we saw it through, but it, it really taught us a lot of lessons about bonding the team together. You've expanded. In the last 10 years, you've expanded into other, other cities such as Shanghai, London, and of course, successfully in, into Sydney. You've also expanded from hotels very successfully into, into food and beverage. I recently visited your, your latest venture in Singapore, Meat Smiths, which oh. is your, your smokehouse, which is absolutely fabulous and such a great vibe on a Sunday afternoon there. What was some of your processes that you went through in deciding you know, to actually expand into other, into other cities and of course, to start to diversify into food and beverage? Well, I think, I, I think the first uh, thing we did was to move into restaurants because, it, and, and it was a fairly natural progression, you know, because I think what we did at the start was that we always had a very cool kind of restaurant within our hotels. Our first two hotels was 1929, followed by New Majestic, and both of them had really successful restaurants. In some ways, the restaurants made the hotels, you know, if I, if I look back, because they, they, they drew such a, a strong local crowd. And, and because we were successful in these restaurants within our hotels, it gave us um, the resources in terms of the talent that was there, as well as the reputation to be able to set up independent restaurants. And so in a sense, I, I think it, it gave me a leg up. You know, If I had started a restaurant without that background of having the restaurants and the hotels, um, I think I would have had a harder time. But we, I really got a, a great lesson in how to run restaurants from having those early ones in the in the in the hotel that was in, you know, when I, and when I first planned those, they were almost kind of uh, ancillary to the hotel, but because they became so successful, they become, they, they eventually became front and center of the hotel. So now we are, we're probably equal size hotels and restaurants. Um, and as for overseas expansion, you know, the, the, the thing about, um, about somewhere like Singapore is, I guess it's a, it's a bit of a hub for lots of uh, people coming through and, and, and lots of professionals coming through. And, and when we were very successful at 1929 New Majestic, I started getting a lot of uh, agents coming to us. Hey, you know, you, you, you love these old buildings. How about looking at this, looking at that? And, and most of the you know, 
nine out of ten times they were rubbish. Uh, you, you oh, okay? No, you know. Uh, but once in a while, you got this, this gem, and and you know, after a while, having doing these hotels becomes a bit of an obsession, um, and people bring opportunities to you all the time after a while. So I, I, I went around looking at, at some of the projects, and 2010 was a transformative year for us. Um, again, it was a very traumatic year, um, because, well, in a, in a way it was very traumatic, because you know the, 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 the global financial crisis happened in 08, 09, and at that time we were in the midst of developing three hotels, um, and our first overseas hotels were in London, you know, as well as um, um, Shanghai, and, and we had another one in Singapore going, um, this is the over exuberance of, of success. You you think you're gonna handle three open three hotels at the same time, but you know. So in in 08, 09, we were developing these three hotels. We had Wanderlust in Singapore, we had Town Hall Hotel in London, and we had um, um, Waterhouse in Shanghai, all on the go at the same time. The global financial crisis happened, and there was a deep gasp of us like, oh my gosh, you know, what what are we going to? I mean, if you had spoken to me in 09, I was I would have been very 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 nervous. Um, and the only thing I, I can think that, you know, uh, looking back now, I, I think there, there was, we were very lucky in the sense that we secured our financing for our projects before the crisis hit. Because in the midst of the crisis, had you gone to any banks and said, I'm developing a hotel in Bethnal Green in London, <laughs> they, would have shown, they wouldn't even have shown you the door, they would have they laughed you out the door, you know. Um, so I, in this, but by the time we opened in 2010, actually the worst of the crisis was over, and we opened them successfully. Um, so, but we opened in 2010 three hotels at the same time, and they were critical and financial successes, luckily. But but actually, again, a close shave, you know. And and that's why I always tell people there's always an element of luck in everything you do. You you can't assume that you know uh, you've always made the right calculation. In retrospect, you can always say that, but on the ground, <laughs> there's a lot of luck involved. So I, 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 again, you know, it, it was some close and lucky shave. Unlisted Collection certainly has challenged the existing hotel paradigm, especially in relation to design. Earlier on, you were, were talking about culture and the importance of culture. How do you think Unlisted's culture is actually different from your standard five-star hotel? I would say we have always emphasised them. Um, a very flat management structure and, and a lot of uh, autonomy to our staff. That's one of the key things that allows us to run um, properties all over the place, you know, all over the world in different uh, three or four different countries in different time zones and with different regulatory regimes. I mean, one of the things I, I learned early on was to, to rely on my key staff, you know, to, to run business. I'm not a hotelier, first of all, um, um, despite um, you know what most people label me as. To be honest, I've, I've, you know, unlike the most of you here, I've never spent a single day in hotel school. So the things I've, I've learned, I've picked up along the way. Um, I rely on professionals, people like you, who are, who are trained in schools like this, um, to run the business for me. Um, I set them goals, and and I and I give them the autonomy and the and the freedom to run it. So that's that's a, a key kind of thing. I think we have a very flat management structure. We're a fairly informal group. Nobody wears ties or, or calls you know, each other sir or, or you know, our GM titles are, are fairly loosely uh, applied to. So we, we allow ourselves to be much more entrepreneurial you know, and we let each market dictate how they, they get their business and things like that. Obviously within the constraints of the, of the, of the not just the property but obviously of the proposition that we bring as a, as a brand and as a hotel group. Um, and you know, you know, traditionally we've not been really been that good at collaborating with each other across the different countries. They they were so autonomous; they more or less ran uh, each country independently. But recently, we've been trying to to do more, a bit more cross marketing between the between the different countries and different hotels. Okay. I want to, to move on, on a little bit now and talk more about leadership. And and you mentioned that you didn't see yourself as a hotelier. But certainly, you are a leader. There's no question about it. And leading a listed collection to be as successful you know, as it is today is certainly down to yourself and your team. How do you see your leadership style has actually changed from ten years ago, from startup to now? I think certainly at the start, a lot of the things I was doing would have been very tentative, you know, and and a lot of the the things I was doing perhaps was. If I look at the design of 1929 and the first sort of uh, 
iteration of it certainly was, was a bit naive, you know. Um, I, I would try and design things that just, in, uh, for, perhaps the room and things like that, just the way I would like it rather than how, how it might best be uh, operated. In terms of the hiring of the people, a lot of it was they knew a lot more than me. <laughs> so, you know, when I first did an interview, I, I felt like a little bit like a, a sheep interviewing the wolf. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's changed in that, you know, obviously now, despite not being a hotelier, I, I perhaps know a little bit more about how hotels are run, the economics of a hotel. So I'm a little bit more confident now. But in, at the same time, I, I, I do have, I think, still that naivety about how, how a, a business operates as a hotel. Because, again, I've never run a traditional hotel. So, so again, I still do rely on the professionals. And, and, and I like to have good chemistry with the people I hire. So that, that part of it hasn't changed. you know. And I think that was the early part of my success, perhaps, with, with picking the right team for 1929, um, in that, that the, the group of people that we had then. And, and you know what? I think about half of them are still working with us today. Uh, one of them's a GM of my in Singapore now, um, and that's what 12, 13 years ago. So we emphasize a lot of loyalty too. But but I do remember, you know, in my first few hires, me kind of uh, they're they're interviewing me more than I'm interviewing them. Does this guy know what he's doing? You know, is his hotel going to last beyond three months? Um, so I, I I think it's more a question of confidence in, in what you do rather than knowledge or or you know or anything else really. So when you think about recruiting for, let's say, a department head or somebody um, who is going into a management or leadership position, what do you believe are some of the important ingredients they actually need to fulfill that position successfully? I think the most important thing for me is someone showing initiative. You know, I always uh, uh, emphasize that, uh, that having that initiative is the, the most important thing that you, you can grow your career on. And grow as, and, and not be afraid to make mistakes because having having a initiative means inevitably you fall flat in your face sometimes. But you have to be brave enough to go and make those decisions. I mean, what I, I really kind of dislike is someone who dithers and kind of waits for 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 someone to give them an instruction to do anything, you know, all the time. As I said, autonomy and and initiative go hand in hand. If you want your bosses to give you a, a lot of uh, autonomy, you need to have a lot of initiative, and and th that tends to to work best with people who have that that a little bit of that spirit of, of um, you know of fearlessness and wanting to to be, be a bit of a go-getter so I, I try and tease that out of the people I interview you know whatever whatever position and whatever level you try and recruit from um, and and that I think is, is really important I always say to my key hires for example our, our senior management guys we always have them in incentive packages because i say always say to them you know the more money you earn the happier i should be because you are on an incentive you know and and if if you earn lots that means i'm earning lots so i i try not to give people too comfortable a, a package on on the fixed side we always try and make sure that they're they're really entrepreneurial sort those who, who can relish a challenge of going out and chasing goals and meeting their financial targets. I think for a smallish organization like us, that's very important. Earlier on, one of my student groups asked me a question, and I think rather than me answer it, you are probably the best person to answer it because you're on the ground every single day and have a strong grasp of the future directions of the hotel industry. And the question was, where do you see hospitality in the next two years? What are some of the key trends that you see actually occurring within the industry in the next two years? So from the hotelier's perspective, you know, what would your response be to that? I think we are, we are living in very exciting and very dangerous times. You know? The hotel industry is going through some very groundbreaking shifts. I think you know, a lot of you have been reading about all these uh, mergers and acquisitions recently. And that's a result of, of massive disruption in the hotel industry. The traditional hotel industry, you know, the the, the old business models from the from the 2000s and the 90s are gone. You know, the the, the, the all the hotel chains are, are the large ones are now all looking for dance partners, right? Because when the music stops and you're the other you're the guy without the chair and the smallest one, you're you're likely to get uh, picked on by all the vultures. So I think I think in terms of just where where that's leading, if you look at technology, it's it's really allowed, um, uh, you know. The, the traditional, uh, well, the, allowed non-hoteliers to take over a lot of roles of, 
or the hotel groups, whether you're looking at online travel agents, acting very much like hotel groups, but without any inventory, you know, without actually having to manage the hotels. Um, they, they, put, they use a technology platform to sell rooms to consumers without ever having controlled a single room themselves. And they can undercut most hotel, room, uh, uh, most hotel management companies, you know. And, and in, this, in some ways, they've aped the hotel management companies too because they themselves have, you know, these uh, uh, loyalty programs and things like that. So they've learned from perhaps the, the, the parts of the uh, hotel industry that work well, and they've adopted it. And the cost part of it, they, they leave with the hotel management companies, the hotel owners. And not just the, the online travel agents, you have people like Airbnb, you know. And, and again, if you look at Airbnb, their valuation is larger than, I think, you know, virtually any hotel group. And they have more inventory than any hotel group. Um, and again, they don't own a single stock. They don't control anything. They don't have to manage anybody's room. And so their cost structure is a tiny fraction of, of what the hotel industry is. So, you know, in the next two years, you're going to see hotels having to transform their business models. The things that, they, that worked for them five, ten years ago is no longer going to work. You know, is it a question of scale? Is it a question of technology? Is it a question of services? I think it's a combination of all of them. Uh, and the smart ones will, will come out because they, they leverage the technology the best and, and they deliver the service that the customer wants. And it's not just about, uh, you know, having these loyalty programs and things like that because the OTAs are aping all those too, right? But what they probably can't ape is the level of service that hotels, uh, uh, personalized service, you know, I'm not talking just about room service or, or having this 400 pound trench, uh, 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 you know, sheets and things like that. Um, and these are, are things that hotels are strong at because they control the inventory and they control the management. And, and I think that, you know, these are the areas that the modern hotelier has to look at because if you are looking at just the traditional game, um, you know, the, 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 the disruptors out there are going to, to have your lunch. For a student of hospitality management, either an undergraduate student or postgraduate student who is about to finish their, their program, what advice would you give them in relation to the next steps? Well, I think, I think one of the things that you guys should explore is, is you know, it's more than just hotels. It's, uh, uh, you know, the industry is very wide. Um, and it's very exciting now, as I said, there's massive disruption going on. You know, the, the, those among you who are more entrepreneurial might, might want to study what the new technologies coming out are that also allow you to disrupt the big hotel groups. For those of you who are willing to kind of go into the, the operations of hotels will also find that I think that, that, you know, that the changes on the ground will mean exciting opportunities so opening up. Um, as I said, I, th I do think hotels will be managed in a different way in, in, uh, in, in the next, you know, five, ten years, you know, that things will be much less structured in, in brand silos, you know. Uh, hotels will have to be much more uh, agile in how they deliver service and what, what they t with their term service, you know. So I think, you, you know, for all of you going into the hotel industry, this is an extremely exciting time. You, you'll probably find that, you know, in, in some ways the, 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 the most go-getter of you and the most agile of, of you guys will find the, the most interesting careers because, you know, I, I don't think you will find that straight career path from, you know, reception to, to housekeeping to, you know, doing room sales, to rooms division manager and, and all the way up to GM. I, I don't think that you'll find that, that that path is so straight anymore, or so set. You know, there will be lots of detours along the way, very interesting detours. So, you know, I think it's, it's incumbent on all of you to keep an open mind about what you you term a, a hotel career, hospitality career, uh, and really be thinking about, you know, where the hotel industry is going. Because it's not going to be, I don't think it's going to be a straight linear path anymore. If you had graduated in the 80s or 90s, I think the, 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 the certainty of, of getting to that position had you jumped through certain hoops would have been a lot easier. I, I think that, that dynamic, that paradigm has changed a lot. Before we move into the question and answer, there is one more question I do want to ask you. I've had the pleasure of staying at all of your properties in Singapore, oh. and one thing I have noticed about your properties is there are a lot of chairs in these properties. Wherever you look, there are chairs, be it in the, in the reception area or in the rooms, and these chairs are different. Reading your biography, I understand that you are an avid chair collector. Can you tell <laughs> us a little bit more about this? <laughs> well, you know, I, you know how I started collecting chairs is really funny. 
remember I was uh, studying in London at that time, um, um, you know, renting a place with no furniture, and then I, I set about sort of, sort of going to, okay, I'm going to go um, furnish my place, and, and I set myself this, well, I had a very small budget, but I set myself the challenge of trying to do a, a fairly stylish apartment. I was a bachelor at the time. Um, and so I started visiting a lot of second-hand stores. And you know, the interesting thing about London is a lot of these second-hand stores had a lot of interesting furniture, um, all this mid-century stuff. So I, I f bought my first few pieces, and I remember buying a book about chairs and researching it, and, and, and you know, it became a bit of an obsession, so I started collecting a lot of chairs, ended up in storage boxes and boxes. I started collecting things like, you know, barber chairs and dentist chairs, which are huge and very heavy. Um, so, you know, when I first started in 1929, I realized, hey, I've got this whole storage of chairs. And it became one of the, the key points that everyone wrote about. Hey, go to 929 and see this crazy guy's collection of chairs. And, and each subsequent hotel we did, we, 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 were, we were kind of putting interesting chairs in and things like that. And it, was, it became a really a part of the design ethos, you know, to have these interesting chairs. And if you go to each of our properties, there's always a barber chair, for example. I think I have like 24, you know, 24, 25 barber chairs in total, maybe about four or five dentist chairs. Um, <laughs> so in some ways, I fulfilled my parents' uh, ambitions for me to go into the medical field, <laughs> <laughs> not, not to the traditional route. Um, so I think, I think um, yeah, it really started from, from trying to economize and buying my first few second-hand chairs and realizing there was a, a design value to them. And, and, you know, I don't collect as much chairs that I, as I used to. But I, I used to, and, and now, in a way, you know, doing the hotels was, was a similar obsession to doing the chairs. I always got fascinated by the history, and I liked old things, you know, and that's really how it came about. So maybe the hotels followed the chairs. <laughs> and of course, you found a home for the chairs now. Yes, eventually. <laughs> I'd like to now move into our, our question and uh, an answer uh, segment. First of all, I've got a question for you from our Sujo campus that, that's come in. And James at our Sujo campus, leading on from your comments about design, would like to know a little bit more about how important design is in your hotels and how you actually use design to differentiate your hotels. I think our hotels are known for, for being more design oriented. And that's a key signature of the Unlisted Collection. We, we pay a lot of attention to it. You know, we always work only with uh, old buildings, you know, conservation buildings or buildings with a lot of character. And so um, design in some ways is already built in and is very much a part of our DNA. And we always try and work with young, interesting architects. And we never work with the same architect more than once. The idea always to get fresh ideas when we design a hotel, get a fresh design direction, and to really challenge ourselves with each project. So you, you'll see that every hotel is different. And in a sense, we never build brands, you know, we build one-off hotels. The Old Clare will only ever be the Old Clare. The Town Hall Hotel will only ever be the Town Hall Hotel. So for us, the design part of, of the integrity for that one property is, is very important. We, 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 we build the whole design around that particular hotel, that particular concept, that particular city, that particular neighborhood. And we invest a lot into the design, you know, and, and we try and make it something as, as timeless and as unique as possible. I'd like to turn to our audience now, uh, because I'm sure there will be a few questions from, from the audience. So can I please ask for our first question today? And please put up your hand and we'll bring the microphone to you. Hi, um, I was just wondering how many hotels do you have in the pipeline to start now? Actually, you know, I don't have any. <laughs> I, we, I tend to do uh, projects one at a time, be simply because they, they, they get so uh, all-consuming, you know. So I just finished the Eau Claire, um, and, and nothing for this year, um, although I'd like to do something again uh, in Australia. Uh, recently, there was a, a hotel, well, you know, in Australia they call it a hotel, but it's really a pub. But this property called the Terminus Hotel that, was, that came up for sale, and I, I put a bid in, we lost, so nothing. Nothing in a pipeline, unfortunately. But I, I would love to, to do more projects in Australia. Another question, please. Uh, so when you started 1929, uh, 
the initial team which you picked, what was your thought process behind it? Did you try and pick people you knew or you were your friends with you, or uh, did you try to seek some expert guidance at that level? Actually, you know, I mean, the, the thing is, the, the truth of the matter is I knew no one in hotel industry at that time. Uh, and I didn't really know what a job description for, for someone in the industry might be because I was a complete uh, novice at it. So really what I did was I, I went to Singapore Tourism Board. I thought, hey, I'm doing a hotel. How do I recruit people, <laughs> you know, <laughs> things like that. So I, I really kind of reached out to, to various bodies, um, none of which were particularly helpful. So I think, you know, the first couple of hires I had were really just uh, word of mouth because I put out enough uh, sort of word to, to various people that say, hey, you know, I know someone in the, who's running the front desk at this place. And, and so I, I would say, hey, can you ask them to speak to me? And they would come and speak to me. So it was really like that. It was very organic. I didn't even think of going to a recruitment agency or something, which, you know, looking back now, it's probably the logical thing to do. But at the time, I, I literally went to as many people as I knew. Do you know anyone in the hotel industry? <laughs> and, you know, and that's how I hired my first two or three people. And from there, they, they hired people they knew. And, and, you know, maybe about two weeks before the hotel opened, we had, you know, enough people to open the hotel. But six months into opening a hotel, I think I hadn't hired a single person. So it was a, it was an interesting experience. But, uh, you know, that, that's what startups are like in a way. You know, you, you live through the highs and lows, and there's always that empty feeling in the pit of your stomach because you feel you've forgotten something. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a question that's come in from, from Twitter. And the question is, you don't describe yourself as a hotelier. What word do you think would best describe you in a professional sense and why? You know what? The, the, yeah, that's a really funny question. I, for the longest time, I, I, I still feel, you know, in this hotel, not hotel cards, those immigration cards, they always ask you a profession. And I kept my, my practicing license for, for, for a lawyer for, for, I only gave it up maybe about five years ago. So for the longest time, I used to still write <laughs> lawyer, <laughs> although I long since ceased to practice because I had that Asian kind of thing. It was, you know, in Singapore, they call it kiasu, right? Which means you're afraid to lose. So, so I, I, I literally thought, well, if I, you know, go bust overnight and fail in this career, I'm going to go back to practice. So I kept my, op my practicing license for, for a number of years after I, I, I left the profession and there was really no hope of me being, of anyone hiring me as a lawyer. But nevertheless, I, I kept that uh, license. So, so you know, f for the longest time, I identified myself as a lawyer still, maybe, maybe five, six years after I left practice. And, and maybe in the last three or four years, I, I do think of myself more as a hotelier and restaurant. So I do write on the immigration form of hotelier now. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question that's come from our Lura campus, from, from Joseph Mills at our Lura campus. And he's asked, please describe your normal day in your working week. Wow, you know, if, I, if there yeah, is such a thing, <laughs> there, there isn't really because, I, and and you guys will discover that when you go and work in hotels, there is no normal day in a hotel, you know, uh, because you're always reacting to some situation. You have different guests. Uh, it's one of the few professions where there really is, you know, not that much of a routine unless you're maybe in housekeeping, I guess. Um, but but for me, prob probably in the earliest part of my day is just answering emails, um, trying to keep up with all the management reports that come in. And then I, I tend to uh, walk around the hotels if I, if I happen to be near one of them and see what the front desk is doing. But a lot of it is, is reading reports, actually, you know, and, and, and if there's some anomaly in London, say, I'll just ping them an email. Um, but it's a fairly flexible day, I would say. And, 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 you know, a lot of it also involves going around to restaurants, which is a little bit more fun. You, you get to eat food and, and things like that. Yeah. Another question from the audience. It is very interesting of the new hotel idea. So what exactly your target market? And another question is right now you have the Singapore, London, China, and here, right? Mm. So what is the main decision making that you choose the location to start your hotel? So what was the first question again? The first question is what is your target market of, of okay. this? Uh, you know what? I. I always tell my guys that you know we, we, we don't really have a target market, but in reality we do. Um, it tends to be people who, who like design, who are, who are appreciative and, and, and want to go to the kind of place we stay. It's not the typical corporate market. 
It's really hard to put a finger on it, but you know, I would say that the, it tends to be people in their late 20s to, to their early 40s, they, they tend to be a bit more adventurous. A lot of them are in the design field. You know, if, you, if I look at our corporate markets, a lot of video game designers and graphic artists and architects, things like that, because our hotels aren't particularly built for you know, conventional families or conventional travelers who, who perhaps want a big desk or a large wardrobe and, you know, uh, uh, although we have all those things in some of our rooms. But, but really, we attract people who, who want to come to a city and see what locals do and do what locals do. Um, so it, it's not, it, it, but it tends to be people who appreciate design and uh, who, who like to book their own, you know, travel and things like that. We, we, our hotels are never big enough for travel agents, for example, things like that. So, so it, it, we, we always find that it is a similar group of people wherever we are in the world, whether it's Shanghai or, or Singapore or, or Sydney who come stay in our hotel. And now that we're doing a bit more cross-marketing, we, we find that actually they do stay in our, our different properties when they travel to those particular countries. You know? So we, we do have a, a fair amount of, of crossover. Um, as for what kind of uh, make, motivates me to go to different countries, I think a lot of it is just opportunity, you know. I never in my wildest dream thought I'd ever open a hotel in Sydney. Never crossed my uh, mind. But I'd been to Sydney a few times, obviously. It's one of those things, in the, one of the major cities that's close to Singapore. Um, but, you know, the opportunity presented itself. Dr. Stanley Quack, who at the time was CEO of Frasers, came to me and said, I've got just a property for you in Sydney. <laughs> I flew down here. I said, no, no, it's not. <laughs> because at the time it was, you know. But, but I looked at it and I was like, wow, this is cool. You know, I, and I, I kind of fell in love with Sydney again, remembered what I, I loved about it. And we, we, we like to be in key gateway cities. That's the main thing, you know, where there are a lot of international travelers, where there's a stock of uh, beautiful old buildings and, and, and places people like to go, you know. You know, people who are of that you know, group of people who like design and travel and party and going to nice restaurants. That's really where we, we find that our type of hotel works. If you had asked me to go to, say, uh, you know, a smaller city in, in, a, in, a, in Australia, it might have been much more difficult for us as our first property. It had to be probably Sydney or Melbourne, you know. If you had asked me to go to a, a small town in northern England for my first hotel, it probably wouldn't have worked had to be somewhere like London. So, so in a sense, we, we do look for key gateway cities. But what might work or, or not for any particular city, I think, depends very much on the, on the local dimension and the, and the particularities of that, of that particular you know, property. I have another question from our Lura campus, and it's from Edmund. And his question is, how do you use marketing strategies to differentiate yourself and to compete against, obviously, your main competitors and, and especially in Singapore, the large five stars. So, you know, how are these strategies different from your standard hotel marketing strategies? We rely a lot on uh, PR and social marketing. If you, if you look at our hotels, they tend to be visually very strong. So people um, um, and very design oriented. So the first things we always do when, when we do our PR marketing plans for a launch of a new hotel is to target all the design magazines as much as we can. And they tend to, to, to like our sort of product, you know. So we, we tend to always appear in the wallpapers and the, and the monocles and things like that and the design uh, magazines, you know, whether it's um, home and, and garden and all this sort of things. They, t they tend to pick up our hotel. And we obviously also work closely with design hotels. Most of our hotels are part of design hotels. And that gives us a platform of, uh, to leverage off in, in, in the sense of you know, people who, who typically look at those websites and read those papers tend to like the kind of properties we do. So we, we concentrate on that design aspect. We, we all also obviously have a large social media campaign. Um, but that's you know, from our own internal marketing to external ones. So we, we also employ external uh, uh, PR companies. And, and there's a combination of these efforts that kind of starts rolling around in, uh, in the media and starts getting word of mouth out there. Um, and that's typically how we, we launch our restaurants and hotels. And we try and obviously you know, put in interesting restaurants and the hotels that, in a sense, also give leverage to those kind of marketing and PR efforts. So in Sydney, for example, you know, uh, Eau Claire, very unusually for a hotel that size, we have 62 rooms, but we have three restaurants. Um, we have Automata, we have um, 
um, Silver Eye and we have Kensington Street Social. And in a sense, in the local market, the restaurants generated so much buzz that it benefited the hotels too. And, and how we did that was obviously for Automata, we had a, a young local Australian chef who used to work for us in London and he came back to open Momofoku. So in a sense, he was, a, he was already a very well-known uh, uh, personality in Australia. So opening a restaurant with him, Automata, naturally meant that a, a lot of the local foodies and things like that knew it was opening and there was generated a lot of buzz and excitement. And then we had a, a young chef from a restaurant called Noma in Copenhagen. He was the executive sous chef there. And, and when he set up a restaurant in, in, in Sydney, it created a lot of international buzz among the foodies. So I knew that a, cal a chef of his caliber would attract a fa significant amount of international PR, and it really did. And the other strategy also with Kensington Street Social was we brought Jason Atherton in to uh, operate with us in, in Sydney, his very first restaurant in Australia. And that created a lot of buzz around the whole of Australia, you know, the, the press in Melbourne were writing about it, Brisbane, all this, because he was he's a very well-known chef um, um, with multiple Michelin stars. And we had worked closely with him in quite a number of restaurants in Hong Kong and Shanghai, you know. And so, so there was that deliberate effort also to bring in the, the key players into the hotel that we knew would create buzz in different areas of, uh, of not just um, of the hotel industry, but of, of different international press, uh, national press, as well as local press. And it worked out very well for us. And the next question actually leads quite nicely um, into the previous question in relation to your direct competitors, because not only do you compete against the large five stars, but you also compete against numerous other boutique and design hotels. For instance, in Australia, we have Hotel Hotel in Canberra, we've got QT and so on, so on. So how do you differentiate your particular properties against your direct competition? You know, I think part of it is just doing the things you do and, and making sure that you're, you're true to the values of, of your particular group. I mean, something like QT, if I look at them, they are, they are a bit more of a broad-based brand. You know, they are building a QT brand. Um, and, and perhaps Hotel Hotel is more analogous to what we do in, in their positioning and, and their brand identity. They are developing a single brand for a particular market, and that's kind of what we do. If I look at overseas, you know, people like Firmdale, they, they, they perhaps do the, the similar type of thing. And then you have the Como Hotels, you know, another Singapore group who do a similar kind of thing that we do. They, they tend to do single hotels, single brands for that particular hotel. Um, so there are, there are similarities for sure in some of these hotel groups. And, and we, we try to be true to our values. You know, we always work with, for example, with only heritage properties. Um, we have interesting furniture. Um, we always have fantastic restaurants, and that's really our, our, our DNA. So are we very, very dissimilar to something like Hotel Hotel? Perhaps not on the surface, but we try and concentrate on things that we do well. And if I look at what they do, they do a fantastic job, you know. And, and we try and take lessons off them. Um, we, we look at what Como does very well, and we try and pick lessons off them. Um, QT is the same. Um, so, you know, and the space is big enough that you, you're going to have, um, you're going to have to allow various different people to do their own thing. And we, we succeed by doing what we do best, I think. Another question from the audience. Um, you, have a very, you have a very busy career. Um, how do you manage your work-life balance? Wow, that's a tough one, you know? Uh, and, and often I don't manage it very well. Um, and I get reminded I don't manage it very well. Um, but this time, when I came to Sydney, I brought my whole family. So I have my wife here, my four-year-old son, and a, and a three-month-old daughter. And, and that's, a, in a way, a, a way of uh, balancing the work and the, and, the, and the personal life. And I try and, you know, make sure I'm always home on weekends, uh, because with the travel schedule that I have, Often I'm, I'm away during the work week, whether it's in London or Hong Kong or, or Shanghai or, or here. Um, and, and Singapore's a relatively convenient place for, for, for those type of destinations. But it's always, a, it's always a challenge. And it's less of a challenge for if you really enjoy your work, which I do. Um, but, you know, I think you always have to be conscious of the fact that with the family, you, you, you would try and be there on weekends. You try and be there as much as you can. Um, and sometimes you bring them with you. Um, if you can, but it's, 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 it's something I always constantly remind myself of. It's, it's not 
it's, it's never a perfect balance. I have another question that's come in from Suzhou in China, and it's from Nan, and she is actually very interested in relation to the importance of corporate social responsibility. So what are your, some of your strategies and how do you perceive the importance of CSR, corporate social responsibility, uh, for a hotel these days? I think it's, you know what, it's one of those things you, you have to be cognizant of of your community and, and I think of the environment that you work in and the people who are there. And, and that is the key part of, of our brand. So we always work as much as we can with local charities. Um, you know, we always have, uh, we always give time off our, to our staff to volunteer. Um, in Singapore, for example, I, I sit on a few charitable boards and, and every year we, with gala dinners and things like that, we try and help out with packages, hotels. So we try and as a group be as generous as we can. You know, in Australia, we, we, we um, um, work with the local um, um, charities in our area as much as possible. So we do days where for perhaps we'll give a percentage of revenues from our restaurants to them. Um, and in, we do the same in London. We work with community groups. So they often use the town hall for their meetings. Uh, so I think in, in you know, ways large and small, some, some of which are we, we don't advertise at all. We try and work with local communities. So they understand that we are a valuable asset to them and that we are part of their community and we are part of their local structure. We employ locally as much as we can. We use local suppliers as much as we can. Our designers are always local. So we try and embed ourselves. You know, we never try and be a Singapore brand in Australia. We, we, don't, have, we don't hire anyone from Singapore when, when we set up here. We don't bring designers in. We, don't, you know, we try and get everything in Australia. So we, we, we try and localize ourselves, um, be part of the community, give back to the community as much as we can. You know, um, and, and you know, you walk into the Old Clare or the Town Hall Hotel, nothing tells you that there's anything about Singapore about them, you know. Another question that's coming from, from YouTube, and the question is, what is your proudest career moment achievement to date? I, you know, th those goals change all the time because with each new project that you launch successfully and, and that you make an impact with, perhaps that, that for that, for that moment, it, it feels like your greatest achievement. So I would say for now, Old Claire feels like, you know, a pretty good uh, <laughs> achievement because it was a very hard project to get uh, done. And it's opened successfully. And I guess it's, it's, it's been really rewarding uh, to have done that project. So at this point in time, if you ask me, you know, uh, it's definitely, uh, it feels like having opened the Old Claire and the, uh, and the restaurant. Mr. Lowe. We're just about out of time today. Thank you very, very much for coming in. And once again, congratulations on your success with Unlisted Collection. And I certainly hope that it continues. And I'm sure it will from everything we've heard today. I'm sure Unlisted Collection is continue, going to continue to grow and continue to be very successful. But also, it was fascinating to actually learn more about how your operation is somewhat different to a traditional style of, of hospitality. Um, and you have been very successful in doing that. Wherever you have been watching, once again, thank you for tuning in to the Blue Mountains International Hotel Management School Leadership Speaker Series, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you.